Well, for most of the past several weeks, uh, we've been going through a series on hope. We've heard messages about hope in all sorts of different situations. And as I thought about what I was going to preach on today, there was a subject that immediately popped into my head as an area where we could all use just a little bit of hope. Unless you've been living with no contact with the world around us, I'm sure you're aware that we live in very fraught times in our country. There are divides in our nation that start at the top and have torn our society into various factions that seem to loathe one another far more than one would expect from people who live in the same nation. The mere mention of names such as Donald Trump or Nancy Pelosi seem to be enough to raise the anger and the blood pressure of those who disagree with them. Our nation's centuries-old struggle with racism is still alive and well today, with many people's feelings ranging from fear to outright hatred of those who don't look like them. The lives of unborn children are under fierce attack by those who refuse to even acknowledge them as a person. All of this is covered by news media on both sides of the aisle who seem determined to convince us that with every new event, no matter how small, the sky is constantly falling and all of this has affected us as a nation there is a constant simmering level of stress to be found in America and these aren't just abstract concepts that I can talk about today and just act like they only exist up in Washington or they only exist in big cities just in the past couple of weeks we've dealt with many of these issues right here in Virginia and right here in our own community the stress of living in America in 2019 doesn't just affect people in some faraway place. It affects us right here. And today as we talk about hope, I'd like to remind you of some passages in the Bible that deal with some of these issues that we face today. My goal today is that God's word would cut through the tensions of this world and will help you to find comfort and confidence in the sovereign God that we serve. As I thought about the title of this message, I went back and forth on different names, and the title that I settled on, if you uh, have the note insert in your bulletin or if you pulled the notes up on your Bible app today, um, you'll notice that the title of this message is pretty unusual. I dare say that there's probably not been another message preached here with the same title. But as I thought about the constant barrage of outcries that we constantly hear that the sky is falling... I thought that this message would be a good platform to hopefully give you some hope in the age of Chicken Little. And right here at the start of the message, I want to ask you to do one thing for the next few minutes that we have together. Every time I make reference of a scripture passage, I want you to take special note of what it says. Um, Having your notes either on paper or on the Bible app are a great way uh, to keep track of what these references are. And the reason that I say that is that this is a subject where all of us have opinions. And me just adding my own opinions to the mix today isn't going to do any of us any good. But this book right here has the authority of Almighty God behind it. When this book speaks, God speaks. And every single word in this Bible is absolutely true. Even when you disagree with it, that doesn't change the fact that it's true. So for the next few minutes, please pay pay special attention to each and every portion of scripture. Now let's take a moment and ask God's blessing on this time. I'm going to pray and ask God's blessing. Please pray along with me that God would speak to your heart through his word. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for the time of worship that we've already had together. Lord, thank you that we can lift our voices in praise to you through song. Lord, we thank you for the knowledge that when we do so, we join our voices with those in heaven praising you right now. God, we thank you for the privilege that it is to worship you through our giving. God, we thank you for the privilege that it is to worship you through the time of communion that we had as we remembered your death and your sacrifice for us. And God, as we turn our attention to the preaching of your word, God, I pray that we would worship you through this time as well. God, I pray that you would be lifted up and honored and glorified in our midst. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's start out today by looking at how God views the day and age that we live in. And let's, it, it's important as we start this to step back and get a big picture view of God's sovereignty. 
What is God's sovereignty? It's a term that we hear quite a bit. I use it quite a bit myself. But it's not very often that someone takes the time to really define what God's sovereignty means. Basically, God's sovereignty means that he is able to bring to pass every part of his will. It's tied in with the fact that God is all-powerful. There is nothing that can stop God from accomplishing his will. We see this illustrated in the Bible in places like Exodus 14. God wanted a nation of people to get from point A to point B, but there was a massive body of water in the way. No problem. God just made the sea part in two, and the Israelites crossed on dry ground. We see it in Genesis 18, where God's plan was to give Abraham and Sarah a son. They were both far too old to have children. There was no physical way that they could do that. Sarah even laughed at God. But Genesis 18, 14 says, Is anything too hard for the Lord? One year later, Abraham and Sarah were parents. God is sovereign because there is nothing that can stop his will. Jeremiah 32, 17 says, Ah, Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Proverbs 19, 21 says, Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. There is nothing that can keep God from accomplishing his will. This is an ironclad, unchangeable biblical truth. R.C. Sproul once said that it is impossible to have too big a view of God. When you think about what God is in control of, you don't have to worry about thinking about what he's in control of and what he's not. There's nothing that you're going to find, anything or anywhere, that God does not have absolute power over. God's sovereignty is one of his big picture attributes. Now let's zoom in and look at how this applies to our leaders and our culture. First of all, turn to Proverbs chapter 21. We're going to look at Proverbs 21 and we're going to just read the very first verse of this chapter. Proverbs 21.1 says, The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. Now let's get the obvious thing out of the way. We don't have kings here in America. But we certainly do have leaders, and the principle that is found in this verse isn't just limited by the title that our leaders enjoy. As we've already seen, the sovereignty that God has over kings isn't any different than his sovereignty over everyone else. In light of Scripture, it is entirely appropriate, with reverence to the Word of God, of course, to say that the president's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. The hearts of Congress are in the hand of the Lord. The hearts of the Supreme Court are in the hand of the Lord. The heart of the governor is in the hand of the Lord. Now, does that mean that every decision that our elected officials make is a direct reflection of God's will? Absolutely not. To illustrate this, we don't have to look any further than the pages of Scripture. Look at Pharaoh in Exodus 10, Cyrus in Isaiah 45, Artaxerxes in Nehemiah chapter 2. God can use wicked, unsaved rulers to accomplish his will. That doesn't mean that everything that they do is going to be right, but it does mean that God's will is going to be accomplished. And in that, we should take heart. It might sound very trite to say, well, when you see one of our leaders do something that you disagree with, don't worry because God is still in control. And yet the knowledge that God's perfect will is ultimately going to come to pass should fill us with hope because God's will is so much better than anything that the leaders of this world can accomplish there is no campaign promise that any Republican or Democrat can make that can compare with the promises of God and when you can look at the headlines and remember with confidence that nothing is going to shake God's control that can change your outlook on things That's where this goes from an abstract concept that you hear in a sermon to something that changes your life every single day of the week. 
There is no getting around the fact that the words of the Bible are absolute truth. And if these words are in fact absolute truth, if God really is sovereign, that should be more to us than just some nice words to make us feel good on Sunday morning. If you sit here today and enjoy the preaching of God's word and then go out and spend your week worrying yourself sick about what's going on in Washington, do you really believe that God is in control? I've been in various churches all my life and I've heard preacher after preacher and Christian after Christian say, if this happens, it's all over. If this person does this, our country is going down the tubes. And I'm certainly not saying that nothing bad could ever happen to our country, but we do need to remember that any nation, our nation included, exists within the control of God's sovereignty. That's not to say that you're going to to agree with every decision that our leaders make. You certainly have the right to have different opinions than someone else. But when we begin to place our trust more in our nation or our constitution or our leaders, or even in our own abilities, more than we trust in God's sovereignty, we're going to find ourselves falling into that pattern of stress that so many people seem to be trapped in. Our leaders' hearts are in the hand of the Lord. Now let's look at a second passage that will help us to keep a healthy perspective. Turn over to Romans chapter 13. We're going to look at the first several verses of this chapter And in these verses, God is going to speak to us through his word and give us some valuable insight into how we should view our political system. We're going to read several verses here. And once again, please focus in on these verses and really listen to what they're saying. We'll start reading here in Romans 13, verse 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. So let's go through these verses very quickly and just see verse by verse, what they mean. First of all, verse 1 tells us that we are to be subject to our governing authorities. In our case, that means that we are to be subject to the United States authorities, to the authorities of the Commonwealth of Virginia, and to the local authorities wherever we might be. This verse says that there is no authority except from God. Once again, there is no government that exists just by accident. There is no government that exists outside of the sovereignty of God. And verse 2 tells us that when you resist the government, whoever that might be, you are resisting something that God himself has allowed to be placed over you. Now through the centuries, there have been many philosophers and theologians who have tried to explain this passage away. They'll say, sure, this passage says that we should submit to the government but that only applies if it is a government that honors God. Some people have said that these verses apply only if you consent to be governed. And they make arguments that sound really good, but for several reasons are completely false. First of all, always be wary of any doctrinal belief that requires you to explain away Scripture. This is a good principle to apply to any time you're studying the Bible, not just this passage. If the Bible says something and someone says, well, this is what it seems to mean, but here's my 10-minute explanation of why it actually doesn't mean that, be very, very cautious of that belief. God didn't give us a book of riddles. God didn't give us a book of commands that are designed to confuse us. If you're reading the Bible and it seems to clearly say one thing, 
Don't try and overcomplicate it and make it say another thing. But even more importantly, we need to look at the context of this passage. People have said, well, Paul said that we need to obey the authority. But Paul didn't know what things are going to be like in America in 2019. Things are so bad now, and this command just doesn't apply to us anymore. Well, let's take a look at the government that Paul was commanding the Romans to submit to. The Roman Empire was ruled at this point by a guy named Nero. I'm sure many of you are familiar with who he was, but for those of you who don't know, Nero was one of the most evil men to ever walk the face of the earth. Nero had several of his own family members murdered to strengthen his claim to the throne. He had his first wife killed and he personally beat his second wife to death. He had his own mother murdered. At one point, Nero decided that he needed a bigger palace, but there was no room in the city of Rome to build one. So Nero had Rome itself be set on fire, killing scores of people and destroying people's homes so that he could build a bigger palace. He launched the most vicious persecution of Christians that the world had ever seen to that point. And his favorite way to deal with Christians was to wrap them in tar paper and use them as human torches for his dinner parties. Yes, we have had many wicked men and women in our halls of government, but it is safe to say that this country has never seen anything like Nero. And yet that was the man that Paul commanded the Roman Christians in this passage to submit to. We have no room for excuses or explanations. Our government exists within the sovereign control of God, and he commands us to submit to them. Paul goes on to say in verses 3 and 4 that God has instituted governments in this world as a means of restraining evil. One reason that God has instituted governments is for our own protection. The Bible says in verse 5 that you need to be obeying the government not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of your conscience. And then in verses 6 and 7, God tells us some things that we are commanded to give to our rulers. The first category is taxes. This is, once again, a pretty straightforward thing. God commands us to pay our taxes. It's a pretty clear command of Scripture. It might sound strange to say that it's a sin to not pay your income tax, but it's true. And this is a pretty simple command, and if you disobey this command, you'll very often find yourself not only subject to God's judgment, but also to the judgment of the IRS. The next command, however, seems to be much more of an issue for believers today. This passage ends by telling us to give honor and respect to whom it is due. If you are a citizen of the United States of America, the members of our government in Washington deserve your respect. This is a command that is so often completely disregarded by Christians here in America. It's not a new phenomenon. When Barack Obama was president, I heard so many Christians, even pastors, say extremely derogatory and disrespectful things about the man who was serving as our president. Many people do the same with President Trump. I'm sure all of you have heard these things said. It extends to the rest of our government. I see Christians post things and hear them say things all the time that are just flat out disrespectful of the men and women of our federal government. I was saddened just the other day to see a pastor, a man who is supposed to shepherd the flock of God and provide an example of godliness, on Twitter making personal attacks on a member of Congress, insulting their intelligence and making jokes at their expense. Brothers and sisters, this is sin. This has got to stop. You do not have to agree with the men and women who make up our government, but you do have to respect them. Saying something disrespectful, posting something on social media that is disrespectful, or any other action that does not give our elected officials the respect that we owe them is a direct violation of a command of Scripture. And I realize that I'm being very direct about this, but I'm saddened to see that so many Christians find this sin to be so acceptable. And as we look at the government which rules over us, we must remember that God is sovereign, that He holds their hearts in His hand. We must remember that they rule over us by the sovereign permission of God. And we must remember that we are commanded to give them the respect and obedience that they are owed. When you start to look at our current events in light of God's sovereignty, it can start to change your outlook on things. 
Pastor Doug has said time and time again in this series that hope is what? If you know it, just shout it out. Hope is what? Pastor Doug, what is hope? Hope is a confident expectation. That's also a good way to see who's been paying attention for the past few weeks. (laughs) Hope is a confident expectation expectation as pastor doug has put so well so many times it's not a pie in the sky i wish this would happen hope is something that we can have confidence in as we study the bible and come to know more and more about god we should all be very convinced of his sovereignty you can't have god without his sovereignty it's part of who he is and when we see events unfold like the ones that we've seen just in the past few weeks or when one of our leaders does something that we don't agree with, we can cling to the knowledge that God is in control. There's never a day when God turns on the news and says, oh no, I don't know what I'm going to do now. He's in control of it all. As you look at the world around you, just remember that God holds the hearts of our rulers in his hands and that every single member of our government serves only by the sovereign will of God. I can't stand here today and tell you why God allows things to happen. I certainly don't claim to know the mind of God. But I can tell you with confidence that he is in control and that you can hope in him today. So the Bible is pretty clear about how we are to view our government and our current events in light of God's control. But the question then becomes, what are we to do now? How are we to live in these days that we live We've seen what the Bible has to say about the sovereignty of God. And as we move towards a close very quickly today, I'd like to just focus in on what the Bible has to say about the responsibilities of the Christian. What is our responsibility in the culture that we live in? Once again, I'd like to show you some passages of Scripture that will, Lord willing, be helpful in forming a godly outlook on the subject. First of all, turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to take a look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, and we're going to begin reading in verse 1. Starting here, we read, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may live a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. First and foremost, we are to pray for our leaders. Whether they are Republican or Democrat, whether you voted for them or not, whether you agree with them or not, we are to pray for our leaders. I was thinking back this week to a time when I was a kid And I was way more into politics than any kid that age should have been. I was very weird in that regard. And an election had come and gone, and the candidate that I had wanted to win had lost. And I was not very happy about it. And I remember seeing my dad, who had not voted for this person, who was now one of our leaders, praying for that man. And I was in no mood to pray for this person. But my dad told me that the most important thing that we could do at that moment was to pray for their salvation. That made such a huge impact on me. And it's what God is commanding us to do here in 1 Timothy. We are commanded to pray for our leaders. First of all, in verse 2, that we would be able to lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness. And it says that this is pleasing to God. And in verse 4, we see God described as wanting to see all come to a saving knowledge of Him. Folks, first and foremost, we need to pray for our leaders. We need to pray that God would save their souls. I can't stand here today and tell you who's saved and who's not. I don't know their hearts, but I can tell you with confidence that there are a lot of men and women in Washington and in Richmond and down at City Hall who need to be saved. And what a difference it would make in this nation if God started saving souls by the hundreds on Capitol Hill. What we truly need in Washington is not a political party or a great politician. We need God to do a mighty work in the souls of our leaders. And may I ask you this morning, when was the last time that you prayed for the salvation of our leaders? Let me take it a step further. It's easy to pray for the people with the same political beliefs as us. I want you to think of the elected official 
maybe who is not like you. Think of the person who gets your dander up just at the mention of their name. And I'm sure for many of you, there are people like that. When was the last time that you prayed for them? When was the last time that you prayed that God would save their soul? I can tell you today that praying for them is going to do a whole lot more good than getting mad and ranting about them. We are commanded to pray for our leaders. And as we have verse 4 in front of us, we see this heart of God that he wants us to have as well. As Jesus left this earth, he gave us the great commission. In Matthew 28, 19 and 20, we read, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We are here on this earth to make disciples. The heart of God desires to draw people to himself and he has commanded us to be a part of that work by making disciples. Not only do we need to be praying for our leaders, we need to be making disciples. God has not left us on this earth to advance a political party or an earthly kingdom. Jesus said in John 18, 36 that his kingdom is not of this world. I beg of you today, do not let the political system and the events of this world distract you from your mission of making disciples. May I ask you this morning, over the past couple of weeks, just think back. If you were to total up the number of political conversations that you've had with people and your posts on social media, and then if you were to total up the number of gospel conversations that you've had with people, which will be greater? If it's the first category, may I say to you very honestly that you may want to examine your priorities. We are here first and foremost as followers and ambassadors of Christ. And we ought not let anything get in the way of that mission. We are to pray for the salvation of our leaders and we are to make disciples of those around us. In the world that we live in, as we look around us and see our country divided in a way that it has rarely been in our history, we have a hope that nobody else does. It doesn't take a whole lot of looking to see people with no hope. And as the body of Christ, we are equipped to spread hope in a way that can change the world. First of all, we need to have that hope ourselves. That begins with being a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. And yet I've known so many Christians who have a relationship with Christ, but when it comes to events in the world around them, they don't have a whole lot of hope. Far too many Christians are trying to find their hope in a person or a party or even some news organization. As a follower of Christ, we must cling to the hope that can only be found in God. And we must spread that hope to the world around us. And the day and age that we live in, we can't just sit on the sidelines and keep our hope to ourselves. We can't simply marginalize ourselves and circle the wagons and shut out everyone who is not like us. We need to get out into the world with the hope that we have.